Welcome. We're uh, glad that uh, you guys are out there joining us today for this webinar. Uh, my name is Jake Beers. I work for uh, Springdale Public Schools, and I'm excited to introduce uh, Dr. Daniel Barth. He's a University of Arkansas professor. He's going to spend some time with us today talking about safely building the solar eclipse and some activities that you can use in your classroom. Uh, we'll spend the first 25, 30 minutes or so doing activities. Um, and if you have questions as those activities are going, please feel free to type those in the comment box. We'll try and make sure we answer those in a timely fashion. And after that, we'll wrap up the end of our time today with some time for Q&A. So without further ado, we'll turn it over to Dr. Jake, Barth. Thank you. And we'll get started. Hello, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be here with the uh, Springdale Public Schools and students and teachers across Arkansas and the Midwest who are getting excited about the great eclipse of 2017. Uh, I've been invited here because I work for the University of Arkansas as a professor of STEM education, and I run the Astronomy for Educators program. Part of my mission with the University of Arkansas is to reach out to students, teachers, and help them improve not just science education, but specifically astronomy and space education across our state and across the Midwest. So today, we're gonna to talk about the great solar eclipse of 2017. I wanted to start a little bit by talking about the sun. Without the sun, there would be no eclipse, but there are a lot of scientific misconceptions about the sun. Uh, many times, people uh, have some of the wrong ideas. How many of you have ever heard in a classroom, the sun is a giant ball of fire? Actually, it's not true at all. The sun isn't a ball of fire. But how do we know? In science, it's always great to say, I believe this or I hypothesize that. But it comes down to data, data, data. What can you prove? What can you demonstrate? What can you verify with an experiment? So we're going to do an experiment today. We're going to start a fire here at the Springdale uh, Professional Development Center. Just a teeny one. I'm going to take a lighter and I'm going to ignite a candle. Uh, I'm going to move a little bit closer so that you can see this quite clearly. We've got this little candle going on the plate. So what have I done? I've actually just heated the wax in the candle up enough so that it will combine chemically with the oxygen in the air. But if I take this drinking glass and put it on top of my candle, Within just a few moments, the flame begins to wane and then flicker, and finally, it dies. The flame died because we've cut off all the oxygen from the room. So how does this help us with the sun? As you may know, there is no air in space. The first scientist to really prove this in any sort of experimental way was Galileo Galilei. He invented the first refractor telescope in 1609. We still call it the Galilean telescope today. And Galileo started exploring the moon. He saw craters, he saw Maria, he saw that the moon was a land of mountains and valleys, much like our Earth. But interestingly, although he initially thought the dark areas were Maria, he later realized he saw no clouds, no fog, no storms. The moon was waterless. That led Galileo to think, what if the moon is airless? How would he tell? Galileo had observed sunsets. You've observed sunsets too. We see the sun go down as the sun comes down to the horizon. It gets dimmer. It gets redder. And actually, as it slips below the horizon, the air atmosphere around our Earth bends some of that light around the horizon. So the sky goes dark very gradually. When Galileo observed the moon, he noticed that as the moon traveled in orbit, occasionally it would pass in front of a star. And when Galileo observed these events, he noticed that every time a star went behind the limb of the moon, the light went out instantly. There was no fading, there was no dimming, there was no delay. Galileo concluded quite rightly, the moon was airless. Other scientists experimenting with barometers in the 1600s determined that we can't have more than about 100 miles of air. And so, essentially, we know today space exists 
or the boundary to outer space is at about 100 kilometers, about 60 miles high. Above that, there are trace molecules, but no atmospheres, nothing breathable, not enough oxygen to support a candle, much less a great fire. The sun is out in space, like the moon is out in space, and there's no air. If the sun were burning like a bonfire, like a wood stove, it would have gone out long ago. A scientist named Lord Kelvin calculated that if the sun were entirely made of coal and had an unlimited supply of oxygen, it would go out in a few tens of thousands of years. We know the sun has been burning for about four and a half billion years. That's 4,500 millions of years. An incredible, almost unthinkable amount of time. And the sun has enough fuel to keep burning for about another five billion years. So the sun's in its middle age. And no chemical process, like a candle flame, would sustain it. It was not until the discovery of radioactivity and nuclear processes by scientists like Henri Becquerel and Marie Curie in the late 1800s and early 1900s that we came to realize the sun is not a ball of fire. It's not combustion at all. It's a nuclear process. Two atoms of hydrogen are combined under great heat and pressure to make an atom of helium. And when the sun fuses these two hydrogens into a helium atom, it releases energy of all kinds, heat, light, ultraviolet, gamma radiation, all kinds of radiation. And this radiated energy powers all the life, all the biomes, all the climate, engines, all the storms, all the weather, everything on Earth is powered by the sun. So when we're looking at the sun, we're really seeing a nuclear fire, not a chemical one, where it's perfectly safe to go and look at a candle or gaze into a fireplace on a fall evening. It's not safe to look at a nuclear furnace. That's what the sun is. It's far too bright. There's too much uh, ultraviolet radiation, the same radiation that gives you a sunburn. If you're not careful on a summer day, this radiation is streaming down. Although it powers photosynthesis and weather and all sorts of good things for us, we don't want to stare at the sun. The sun is a nuclear furnace. We cannot look at it. We can glance, oh, there's the sun, but we can't stare up at the sun. That would damage us and harm our eyes. The other thing is, you may feel safe. Oh, I don't feel anything happening. But you don't feel the sunburn happening either, do you? You realize it later that night. Ouch, I've got a sunburn. I was out at the pool too long. Well, the sunburn on your eyes can be more serious than a sunburn on your skin. And we can't risk our eyesight. So we must emphasize safety, safety, safety. If you're a teacher, if you're a parent, if you're a student, if you're an interested person in science and astronomy, please, you must protect your eyes. It's the very first rule of solar eclipse observing. One of the best ways to observe the eclipse is with a pair of these handy solar eclipse glasses, the height of fashion. We didn't get these from Gucci. We got these from our friends at Explore Scientific here in Springdale, Arkansas. Like many vendors, they're selling out of their eclipse glasses now. So if you've waited until the last week, you probably have to get on Facebook and ask your friends, who has some glasses I want to observe the eclipse? I'm going to show you some other ways if you don't have a pair of solar eclipse glasses. But these, we simply wear them on our face. Uh, these are, they look kind of cheap. Um, they're a cardboard frame and they have two little mylar plastic lenses. And the lenses, the plastic lenses are infused with aluminum. So they let through only a few thousandths of the total light of the sun through. And so with these on your face, it's perfectly safe to sit and gaze at the sun for as long as you like. However, these glasses are meant just for your face. You can't go and say, ooh, I'm going to put glasses in front of my binoculars. I'm going to put my glasses on and then look through a telescope. Absolutely not. These are just for your face, looking up at the sun. Think of them like a pair of sunglasses, okay? That's essentially what they are, is real sunglasses, but we cannot use them with other optical equipment. We can't look through a camera, we can't look through a binocular, we can't look through a telescope. No, no, no. 
for you teachers out there. And Springdale School District, I love them. They made a commitment early on to buy a pair of Eclipse glasses for every child in the district. About 26,000 young people are going to get to go out. And here in the Fayetteville metro area, what we call Northwest Arkansas, they'll see about a 92% eclipse. And this will be wonderful, an experience of a lifetime for many of these students. And with a pair of eclipse glasses, they can observe in complete safety. If you're a parent and your kids want to observe, as long as they have the glasses on, they're fine, they're safe, they're A-OK. -okay. So these help protect us from the sun's radiation. But I occasionally get questions. Hey, Dr. Barth, I couldn't get a pair of solar eclipse glasses. Oh my gosh, I tried one store after another. I waited too long. Gee, they've sold out. How can I observe the eclipse safely if I don't have a pair of these glasses? Do I have to miss the event? Well, happily, no, you really don't. We can observe the eclipse safely using a number of things that you might have common around the house. One of the very best ways to observe the eclipse is with a pair of binoculars. Now, you might be confused because just a minute ago, I said, don't use binoculars and stare at the sun. And that's still true. But you also notice that these binoculars look a little weird. I've taken some kitchen foil and put a piece of kitchen foil around one side. So essentially, this isn't a binocular anymore. It's a monocular. It just has one set of lenses. What's really interesting is that with a binocular, I can use this as a solar eclipse projector. The light, when you use a binocular, the light normally goes through. If you're looking at a bird or a baseball game or the moon, the light goes through and forms an image out here. And no matter what you're looking at, if you're looking at the moon, if you're looking at a tree, a bird, a deer, uh, a player on the football field, of course, they look right side up, right way around, binoculars, uh, correct the image so that it's all quite nice, but they'll also project an image of the sun. Now, if you take a pair of binoculars with foil on one side, and I've got a pad of paper here, if you go ahead and hold the binoculars up with the big end, the objective lens, pointing towards the sun, then with a little practice, you can project an image of the sun down onto a piece of paper. Now, you need to try this before the big day, okay? Um, as you might imagine, if you're holding this up, you gotta get the angle just right. You gotta be pointing it precisely at the sun. A lot of times what works is you start very close to the paper, oh, there it is, and then you draw it back a little bit. The farther back you draw the binocular, the larger the image will be. If you're a parent or if you're a teacher who doesn't have solar eclipse glasses and you're observing the sun, a binocular is one of the best, safest ways for everyone to observe. The reason is, let's say the sun is up here to my right and I gather my students around and I say, okay kids, here we go. I'm pointing the objective lens to the sun and I'm projecting my image down here when my students are standing around, staring at the image on the paper, the sun is behind them, over their shoulder. So if you're using a binocular to project an image of the sun and your children or students are looking at it, they automatically have their backs to the sun. It's a perfectly safe way to observe. If you're a scout leader or a teacher or you have a group of children from a church group who want to observe the eclipse with you, this is one of the very best ways. It works really nicely if you have an easel or something where you can prop uh, the notepad, um, or if you have a, a partner, a helper, who will hold this for you while you project it. And you can go ahead and observe the sun, and you can see the eclipse as the moon slowly moves across the face of the sun, reaches its maximum here in Fayetteville, we'll see about a 92% eclipse. So all but 8%, a little sliver of the sun will be obscured, and then it passes off. Now, it turns out that this whole process takes about three hours. Um, 
the whole process from what we call first contact, where there's a little nibble out of the sun's disk, the moon first starts to move in front of the sun, to maximum eclipse, to what we call last contact, when the moon finally moves away. <coughs> Excuse me, this process takes about three hours. Um, some of us, astronomy geeks like me, will be out for the whole three-hour extravaganza. A lot of people are going to go, it's changing so slowly, oh my gosh. A lot of people are not going to stay for the whole time. Well, how do we document this? How do we make a record of this for our classroom? One of the very best ways, I've taken this uh, pad of paper, and I think you can see it here, and I've taken a cap from a sports drink, a Gatorade bottle, and a Sharpie marker, and I've drawn 12 circles, uh, neatly arranged and numbered. So what am I doing here? Well, <clears throat> with my binocular, by holding it at different distances, I can control it so the solar image fits precisely in one of the circles. If you go out, say, every 15 minutes, uh, let's say every 10 minutes, let's get a nice data record. Every 10 minutes, that's six times an hour, and you hold up your binocular, okay, and we fit the solar image into the circle, and then a helper student uh, goes ahead and traces a line to show how much of the sun is covered. You can go every 10 minutes and you can put the times down by the circles, and if you're going to observe every 10 minutes for the whole eclipse, the whole three hours, that's about 10 times per hour, uh, six times per hour, excuse me, every 10 minutes. So you'll need about 24. So two pages like this with two pages of circles, and you can make a record of the entire eclipse. The other nice thing about projecting with a binocular is that when you do project the image onto a plain white piece of paper with the binocular, that image is plenty bright enough to snap a picture with a cell phone. So if you have a cell phone and your students have cell phones, and frankly, if your students don't have cell phones, um, you're probably teaching kids who are pretty young, but uh, you as the teacher would probably have a cell phone. You can go ahead and every few minutes, okay, bang, let's go ahead and take a picture. If you take a picture every 10 minutes, you'll have 24 photos. Guess what? There are really nice free pieces of software which will allow you to make a GIF or GIF animation. So you can put those picture images together and you can have a GIF of the solar eclipse from your little projection with a binocular. It's really quite amazing. The other thing you can do when you're done and you've got your 24 images, one for every 10 minutes, on a piece of paper. You can go ahead and color in the dark part neatly and then photocopy these. One photocopy, this takes two pages, so you can give two pages to each child and then they can go ahead and cut these images out, paste them on a piece of index card and with the images all pasted on a set of index cards, they can make their own little flip book. Now, kids today know about cell phones and computers, but uh, maybe you're like me. When you were a kid, you used to take your notebook and make little flip pictures where you could make the little stick man run or jump or the skateboard move. Well, guess what? If you take these solar images and paste each one on an index card, you can flip and see a little low-tech animation of the solar eclipse that you witness, and you can preserve it in your classroom for your kids. This is a cheap enough little science experiment. Every child can make one. Every child can take it home. And when mom and dad say, what did you learn today in school? It's not going to be nothing. They can say, we saw the solar eclipse of 2017. We made a flip book. Look, mom, look, dad. Here's what it looks like. You know how impressed your parents are going to be when your kids come home with a flipbook record of the solar eclipse that they made in your class? Wow! You're going to be their favorite science teacher of ever. Of course, we can't manage an eclipse for you every year, um, but the next one is only seven years away. 
So we hope you'll try some of these fun activities. Some people have told me, gee, I don't really understand how the eclipse works. How does it happen? How does it, what happens out in space when the eclipse happens? And really, the uh, best thing I can tell you is that, in fact, the moon moves in front of the sun. So in science, of course, one of the things that we like to do is we like models. So here we have a model, and models aren't always what you think. They're not always the right shape. Sometimes we simply use models as symbols to represent things. Oh, here's a fire. Here's the sun. We're using a lighter to model the sun. You could use a flashlight, too, if you don't want a lighter in your classroom. Take your t-ball moon and move it in front. Oh, look, I can't see the flame anymore. Oh, wait, there it is. And so what's happened here? Did I turn off the lighter? Did I douse the flame? I did not. All I did was I took something that isn't transparent and doesn't glow by itself. We used a t-ball. In space, it's the moon. And when it passes in front of the sun, you can't see it for a while. Now, it turns out, if you wanted to see a model of the Earth and the moon, here we go. Here's a t-ball. Let's say this is the Earth. How big is the moon? Well, here's a little glass marble. Move it a little closer so you can see it. And this is about the right size with the t-ball Earth and the marble moon. How far away are they? Well, on this scale, this marble would have to be about seven and a half feet away from our t-ball to be in scale. So we're not going to do that today. Uh, models of the Earth-Moon system are really big. They take up a lot of space. But we can get an idea of the relative size here. So what's happening? Well, as the moon passes in front uh, between the Earth and the sun, what happens is the moon's shadow is going to fall on the Earth. Now, the sun is very, very large, much larger, about 400 times larger than the moon. So it turns out that the moon's shadow, because the sun is such a large light, the moon's shadow tapers to a point. It's shaped kind of like an old waffle cone, right? It's a, it's a cone, and this cone from the moon's shadow reaches out just about to the Earth's surface. Matter of fact, the moon is about 3,500 kilometers wide, uh, and by the time the shadow gets all the way down to the Earth's surface, the shadow is only going to be, depending on where you are, local geography, 50 to 60 miles wide. And this dot, this circular shadow of the moon, is going to move across the United States, starting at the coast of Oregon, and it'll go from northwest to southeast, finishing up off the coast of South Carolina. So this tiny shadow, this 50-mile-wide shadow, Essentially, it's like taking a map of the United States and taking a big blunt Sharpie marker and er, drawing a line across the map. Unless you're on that line, you will not see a total eclipse. <coughs> if you are away from the line, the farther away from the line you are, the less of an eclipse you're going to see. But what we call the partial eclipse shadow is going to cover the entire United States most of Canada, and most of Mexico. So almost anywhere in North America, you're going to be able to see a solar eclipse. So if you're watching and you're living in Southern California or Maine or Florida or Georgia or Illinois, uh, then you're going to get to see a partial eclipse. Our students here in Northwest Arkansas are going to get to see a partial eclipse. There's going to be one group of very lucky young people who are going on a field trip uh, with myself and their science teacher, Mr. Cooper, and we're going to go up to St. Joseph's, Missouri. We're going to see the total eclipse, one of the rarest celestial events there is. But you can see the eclipse and enjoy it from anywhere in the United States. <coughs> Excuse me. So what do we do if you don't have 
pair of solar eclipse glasses, I don't have a pair of binoculars, well, you can make yourself a little mini solar eclipse projector. And I've used a cardboard tin of breadcrumbs. Move this a little closer to the camera so you can see it. This is a cardboard tin and I've modified it a little bit. As you can see, I've taken a pair of scissors and I've cut a notch out of it and I've preserved the plastic cap. And I don't think you can see it on this end, but I've taken a sturdy pin, push pin works great, and bop, put a hole, a small pinhole, and now I've made what's called a pinhole camera. So with this, if I point this end, the end with the hole in it, towards the sun, I can look inside here. The best way to do this is to stand with your back to the sun. Here we go, the sun is up this way, and I can tilt this, and I can see inside, ooh, there will be a small image of the solar eclipse. This will be quite small. You'll see the image is going to be uh, only a few millimeters wide, so it'll be quite small, <clears throat> but it does work. Now, this idea of the pinhole camera, if you don't have, I mean, breadcrumbs are cheap enough, you could go buy a package and put the breadcrumbs in a plastic bag to save and use the container. But if you didn't have breadcrumbs, <clears throat> see if I can get my pin here, here we go. You could take a regular plastic drinks cup. This is like something you'd see for a picnic and just hold it carefully and boom. There we go, I made a nice hole. This will be a solar projector. And again, all I have to do is hold a sheet of paper. You can even project it onto your hand if you want to. Uh, nothing unsafe is going to come through here. Uh, and so you can project the sun. There are lots of ways to make a pinhole projector. Some of us have seen pegboard. I looked around in my garage, I didn't have a piece of pegboard to spare that was of a convenient size. But you can take a chunk of pegboard and hold it up. Every hole will act as a pinhole camera. And on the ground, on the sidewalk, you will see dozens of little images of the solar eclipse. Don't have a piece of pegboard? You could take a thin piece of plywood or a piece of sturdy cardboard, uh, like you'd find from a cereal box, and make a hole with a paper punch. Hold it up, and that hole projecting down onto the ground four or five feet away from you will make a nice image of the solar eclipse. One of the most stunning views of a solar eclipse comes from what I call the shady tree projector. You've been out on a sunny day, I'm sure, and enjoyed the shade of a nice tree, and underneath the tree you notice there are dapples of sunlight. Maybe what you didn't know is each of those little blobs of sunlight is round. It doesn't matter about the holes between the leaves, or even if the holes between the leaves are round, doesn't make any difference. Every bit of sunlight on the ground is a circle because it's an image of the sun. We see it so often we don't really pay attention to it. But during this great solar eclipse, try standing under your favorite shady tree, <clears throat> especially if that tree is somewhere where the shade falls on concrete or bare ground. If it doesn't, spread out a nice white sheet this eclipse happens in the Midwest, uh, for most of us, around the midday. So if you spread a nice white sheet or a large piece of butcher paper underneath a shady tree, what you'll see is dozens and dozens of images of the solar eclipse. Here in Fayetteville, we'll have about a 92% eclipse. So at solar maximum, we'll see dozens and dozens of little crescents, like very thin crescent moons projected onto the ground. So these shady tree pinhole cameras can let anyone, you don't have to have any money at all uh, to enjoy a shady tree. And you can sit in your chair and watch the images of the crescents of the eclipsed sun play across the ground in your yard or in your playground at school. I'm hoping we've had some questions come in. We have, we have a couple. Um, Excellent. Uh, I'll, come, I'll come stand next to you. Excellent. All right, so uh, first question was about solar eclipse glasses. Um, okay. So, you know, these obviously are- You betcha. 
Uh, maybe you could talk a little bit about the rating scale uh, of the ISO uh, certified glasses. And then one specific question, uh, their solar glasses uh, had like a three-minute continuous use Right. Where it said three minutes continuous intermittent over time, and right. just had a, had a it was a school district wanting to know how they would uh, proceed with that. You may not be an, obviously you can't speak for the manufacturer, but maybe no. some recommendations on what that IS, maybe means. Yeah, sure. ISO standards. Um, basically, this is an optical professional engineering society, and if they've certified these as solar eclipse glasses, that means they pass through only. 0.0003%, uh, which is something like three ten thousandths of the light. And uh, that amount of uh, sunlight coming through is so faint and so dim, it's like standing in your bedroom at night with the lights off when you get up, try to find your way to the bathroom, and everything's kind of gray. Uh, so this is going to let through only a tiny, tiny part of the light. Still, when we look at the sun, there is ultraviolet light which is coming through. The aluminized mylar does an excellent job shutting that out, but um, for safety's sake, and engineers love safety, we generally like to have a big wide safety margin. We don't build a bridge for just the weight of the trucks going across it, but we say, what if we had a traffic jam of trucks all carrying three elephants? And so we engineer things for uh, a safety margin usually with something like this with your eyes uh, many times. But still for safety's sake, go out and observe the eclipse. You look for three to five minutes and then you go ahead and take them off. These are excellent because very few people are going to want to stand and stare for three hours. And if you've got children in a classroom, okay kids, we're gonna set a little egg timer and every 15 minutes, we're going to go out for three minutes and look at the sun. And you can make a little sketch. Have the children make a sketch each time. Um, and they look, they sketch, they've got little cards um, which they can, you know, take bottle caps or, or school compass and draw their circles so they're pre-drawn. Oh, I'm going to look, I'm going to draw, I'm going to look, I'm going to draw. Well, guess what? They're not staring if they're out there for three or four minutes. They're only looking for a minute or so at the sun. It's going to be perfectly safe. Um, Obviously, the main thing as a teacher when you have a class with uh, eclipse glasses, and you have to practice this beforehand. Everybody puts on their glasses. They turn to look at the sun. Okay, we look, we turn away, we draw, we put our glasses on, we turn back. What you want to make sure you tell your kids is don't peek. You never want to go ahead and take a look or just for a minute, just for a minute. No, absolutely not. And that kind of means as the teacher, well, guess what? Um, you're going to be supervising most of the time rather than observing. Um, maybe you can have the eclipse glasses and take your first look. Okay, yeah, it's there. Everybody have your glasses. Everybody put them on, turn around, look at the sun, turn around, face me, take them off. This kind of a safety drill is something we practice beforehand so kids know what to do. We don't want them to miss this event, but we absolutely want them to be safe for this event. Great. Um, <clears throat> pictures with your phone. So yes. Can you take a picture with an iPhone or an Android phone, an Android device, you know, of the sun during that time? Ah, if, yes. Um, it won't come out very well for you. Uh, if you've ever taken a picture outdoors where the sun ends up in the picture, just kind of bright and it washes out everything, um, you're not going to get a good result. Mm -hmm. I suppose if you had an iPhone, I haven't tried this. The last eclipse I was in was in the early 90s, 91. Cell phone cameras weren't a thing. So I suppose you could take this and go ahead and put the solar eclipse glasses over your iPhone and take a picture. It certainly wouldn't hurt your iPhone. Um, but obviously you would need to make sure your eyes are shielded or that right. you know, yeah, you're not... The best way to do it, um, actually, my phone's just over there. If you could hand it to me. Sure. And let's go ahead and uh, we'll open these. And this would be something that maybe as a teacher you would, you would not have your students... I would not have my students do this. I would do it as a teacher. I would take and go ahead and open my glasses. My camera is right here. So I would go ahead and put it and hold it this way. 
and then I would activate my camera, the sun's up here, I'm looking at the image, I'm not, you know, I'm not going to do this, I'm going to look at it kind of at an angle, okay. and probably try several pictures, and uh, try touching to focus and various other things. Mm -hmm. I think this would be a great science experiment. Um, if you have high school students who are old enough to try this safely, awesome. Um, younger kids, not so much. Uh, figure uh, high school kids are older teachers, but cell phone cameras weren't a thing when we had the last great eclipse across America. So this would be a wonderful experiment to try. And I would love for you, if you get some good photos, email them to me uh, at astronomyforeducators at gmail.com, uh, or I'm sure you can email them to the Springdale website page, and we'd be happy to share them. I'd love to see the results of your experiment with this. And then uh, one more question, and I'll check and see if we have any more. <clears throat> uh, is the light from the sun any more, or the light or anything from the sun any more dangerous on an eclipse day, or is it just no? So it's exactly the same <clears throat> in terms. It's of exactly the same. Um, the real problem with an eclipse and why people say it's dangerous, as the sun gets more than about eighty percent covered, the light is dimmed enough that your eyes feel comfortable looking at it. Gotcha. But the ultraviolet, the skin-burning, eye-burning rays uh, are still plenty strong enough, even with 90% of the sun covered, that you cannot look at the sun. Um, the brightness will feel, oh, look, the brightness is going way down. It feels comfortable. But that ultraviolet radiation that we cannot feel burning our skin or burning our eyes is still present. So we have to have solid science laboratory discipline when we do this activity. All right, let me check and see if you have a few more. Uh, anything else? Any um, I'm really hoping that people will take a pair of binoculars and make some projections and take some pictures. Maybe you can have somebody take a picture of your students observing this image and send them to us. We'd love to see them. Uh, my students at the University of Arkansas who are science and math teachers in the making will all be out trying to observe the eclipse in Fayetteville <clears throat> and for them they will be not teachers in training but young teachers in the classroom seven years from now when the next great American eclipse comes by so I'm hoping that they're all going to learn how to do this so seven years from now uh, and that would be in 2024, I think. I think, think it's uh, April 8th. Is <coughs> the date. I think it's April 8th, uh, 2024. Yeah. So um, and that one goes through Arkansas. That one goes through Arkansas, and uh, God willing, I'll be here. Yep. But I'm sure all my young teacher trainees will be young teachers, and the, they can say, oh, no, uh, I had Dr. Barth's class at the University of Arkansas. I know how to do this, Mr. Principal, Ms. Superintendent. We can do this, and they can rev their kids up. Have any more fun questions? That, you know, that was it. So we, uh, I think we can go ahead and wrap this up. Excellent. Um, um, so we just want to thank you on behalf of Springdale Public Schools for coming and joining us. We thank the people who went home and watched today and looking forward to sharing this video over the next few weeks or the next week or so as we get ready for the eclipse on Monday. Such an exciting event. It is. Uh, I've seen a number of partial eclipses, but I've not been in totality uh, in my entire life. I've been an active astronomer for approaching 50 years now yeah. and uh, so I'm just like a little kid waiting for Christmas okay. I'm so excited and I'll look forward to seeing you when the Sun goes dark and I hope you'll send your experiences and maybe some photos of your kids enjoying and learning with this great celestial event to us at our website thank you all very much it's been a pleasure <laughs>